Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Courtney Searles, and I'm the Vice President of Development and Alumni Relations. Some of you may recognize this background, but many of you may not. I actually am sitting here in our Zoom format in front of our brand new science building, the Hall of Science at American University. So when you're able, we look forward to welcoming you to campus and where you can see this new magnificent addition to campus. I want to I started too early. I'll give it a moment. Good evening, everyone. My name is Courtney Searles, and I'm the Vice President of Development and Alumni Relations, and am delighted to welcome you this evening. If you don't recognize the background that's behind me, it is because it is the newest building addition to the American University campus, our new Hall of Science. So I do hope when we are able to join and gather again back on campus that you'll come to see this magnificent building. I want to welcome you to today's event, hosted by the Black Alumni Alliance on Racial Inequities in COVID-19 and the Economic and Health Impacts on Black Communities. It is not possible to host a conversation of this nature without acknowledging what a critical time it is in our nation and in our world. I'm extremely grateful to work alongside the Black Alumni Alliance at American University as we navigate the challenges and the opportunities of this time. The murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others, coupled with the lack of legal accountability, has forced a reckoning in our country, highlighting for us what so many of you already know. Additionally, the COVID-19 virus has hit the Black community particularly hard, exposing systemic issues in our healthcare system. We need ongoing action and heightened dialogue to continue the centuries old fight for liberation and justice. The Black Alumni Alliance is doing tremendous work to, collect, to connect alumni and to support the student experience at American University. Their leadership continues to inspire me, all of my colleagues, the entire a and the entire AU community. Now, before we get started, I want to acknowledge and thank a few of my colleagues from AU leadership who have joined us tonight with us are Vice Chairman of the Board and Trustee Gina Adams, Fanta Av, Vice President of Campus Life and Inclusive Excellence, Cheryl Holcomb-McCoy, Dean of the School of Education, Raina Lenny, Assistant Vice President of Alumni Relations, and Asantawa Boachewa, Director, Multicultural and Infinity Engagement. And of course, very special guest who will be moderating this evening, our president, President Burwell. As we prepare for meaningful conversation this evening, I wanna share a few housekeeping notes. First, we've muted everyone by default so we can enjoy conversation in the beginning without disruption. But you're welcome to use the chat box and encourage to submit questions to our, our evening's webinar administrators. We'll be monitoring the questions closely We'll do, to, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can this evening during the call. If we cannot address a question, we'll follow up in an email. Now, it's a privilege for me to introduce you now to Kathy Russell, who will serve as your host for today's conversation with President Burwell. Kathy Russell is the incoming chair of our Black Alumni Alliance. She is one of our most dedicated volunteers having led this and many, many other events in her time and in the future. 
And as an avid mentor for current students, we thank Kathy for everything that she is doing for American University and, and the students we serve. Kathy earned her BA from the School of Communications in 2004 and currently works as Assistant Director of Communications at St. Albans School. Kathy, I turn it over to you. Evening and welcome to the ninth annual Congressional Black Caucus virtual event. As Courtney said, I'm Kathy Russell, incoming chair of AU's Black Alumni Alliance and proud Ebony Eagles. The BAA's mission is to provide support to alumni and students of the Black community and encourage professional development and networking opportunities to uplift Ebony Eagle, while also positively impacting the overall culture at American University. The Black Alumni Alliance, in partnership with the Washington College of Law Black Alumni Association, have worked together annually to recognize AU community members for their commitment to advancing the global Black community and addressing numerous issues we face as a Black community through at least one of the following four objectives of the CBCF. Advancing through education, assuring quality healthcare, increasing equity in foreign policy, and ensuring justice for all. I'm honored to serve as a host of this very important and timely conversation with AU experts on racial inequities in COVID-19 and its impact on the Black communities. 2020 has brought on new realities for many of us in ways we weren't prepared to handle. The cascading series of catastrophic events in the past few months has landed especially heavily on Black students and colleagues and other underrepresented people of color. COVID-19 upended our lives mid-spring semester and significantly impacted Black communities with substantially higher infection and morbidity rates. COVID-19 exposed the vast disparities in healthcare access that we were always part of our reality, but weren't always noticed by many of us. Also, the Black Lives Matter uprising began and gripped the nation this summer. The movement gained momentum following the recent incidents of the unlawful murdering of Black people who were just going about their daily lives, shopping, jogging, or sleeping in their beds, and continued to be harassed by white counterparts, youth, use police presence for their safety. <laughs> the theme of today's session was selected to help us think more deeply about the racial inequities that have emerged in the cases and deaths of COVID-19 in the U.S. and to spark a conversation about structural racism. This event is just one of the many events hosted by Ebony Eagles at AU. I encourage all of you to join us for the virtual multicultural alumni reunion, better known as MCAR, beginning October 17th. Virtually, we will continue the tradition of Celebrate with virtual performances by a youth gospel choir in El Aquila, a DC-based group of mariachi artists. We'll convene multicultural students and alumni on Thursday, October 22nd, and close the reunion with the annual multicultural Greek gathering, formerly the Greek brunch, on Sunday, October 25th. Currently, it is my pleasure to introduce our 15th president and the first woman to serve as AU's president. She is a visionary leader with sizable experience in both public and private sectors and brings to AU her extensive knowledge of managing complex organizations and advancing solutions to some of the world's most pressing challenges. Please join me in welcoming President Sylvia Burwell. Kathy, thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, but even more, um, thank you for your uh, leadership and your incoming chair of our Black Alumni Alliance. And thank you for all that I know you're gonna do this year um, as you lead us through this coming year. And thanks for all that you have done, the many events as, as was mentioned before by Courtney. And I also wanna thank the members of the BAA um, and our current chair uh, that's transferring now to Kathy, which is Gordon Andrew Fletcher for all that you have done as well. And thank everybody for attending tonight. Um, this is an event that I've attended every single year uh, since I've been uh, at the university and it's one that I always enjoy. We're doing it a little differently this year, but that is great and I'm glad that we are. And I'm glad you mentioned um, Celebrate uh, and the events of MCAR, another favorite of mine. I will be missing the food and the live performances, but I already have, um, this is one where I taped my um, participation. So I am participating this year as well and I hope everyone else will. 
And um, Courtney, thanks for mentioning the members of our team that are here uh, as part of this event, and especially our vice chair, uh, Gina Adams. Gina, thank you for, for making time and enjoy joining us this evening. And everyone on this call in one way or another has actually played a part in lifting up AU and our entire community. And I'm really thankful for that, especially during this time. And so I just wanna say thank you for that in terms of it's about this event, but it's about so much more that all of this group does. And just recently, US News and Report, World Report published the rankings. I think everybody knows we went up one um, in, in terms of the ranking, which is a good thing. But our work together is consistently moving us, and it's moving us in great places in great ways. Um, one of the things for the first time ever we appeared on these rankings as American University is the 35th most innovative university in the US. And conversations like this are a part of what makes us that. We also were recognized as um, the tw number 25 in the nation in undergraduate education. And so many of you all that are part of this have participated in that when you were at American, but you make that a reality in terms of the engagement of our alumni with our students in terms of why that undergraduate experience is so uh, such a great thing. So I um, want to thank you for that. American University, we believe, is building the future of higher education, and you all are all a very important part of that. And another category that we're particularly um, proud of is that we were ranked 11th in terms of the nation for the quality of our study abroad program. And while we know that COVID-19 has meant that many of our students can do that program, it is an important program for AU. And we're proud of the way that our students get out in the world and they truly see the lives of others they see the problems they face and they contribute to the solutions. But tonight's event is a reflection that we don't have to travel uh, to know and see that. That really often it's just talking to your friend or your neighbor uh, in order to understand what are real challenges in our nation. And that is the topic for tonight. And if we look at a quote from MLK, um, a quote that I know many of you all know that say, where he said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman. And he, I think, deliberately chose that word inhuman. And as we see, you know, this is one of our nation's greatest inequities, and it is in the health space. And having had the opportunity to work on these issues and know a lot about the numbers, it is an incredible space. You know, the Affordable Care Act, one of the things that was most important that it did, it was the 20 million people that gained health coverage, it was disproportionately in terms of reducing the uninsured and people of color in our communities. And that's because there was a disproportionate inequity and there still is in terms of, and that's just getting to coverage. And, you know, um, Courtney mentioned sort of the triple crises that we're facing as a nation, a crisis of health, a crisis of economics, and the nation starting to face what is the result of longtime institutional racism. And I think the virus has shown us that in so many ways in terms of the numbers and things um, that we're going to see. And I think we know that, you know, it is the health crisis. It is things like last week's announcement of the grand jury's decision in uh, Breonna Taylor, where we saw these wounds only deepened uh, in terms of there's the health inequity, but the other is coming together with it. And so um, it really is, though, the kind of moment that AU Eagles are prepared for. And for years, I think you all know we have been on our journey. Um, our journey of inclusive excellence. And so many of you all have been with us. I can remember the first uh, event that I did and those were uh, very, very challenging times for us as a university. We continue to move. Um, we know that there's much progress that we need to make, but we know that we are also a community of change makers and we are committed to using our scholarship, our learning, and our role as active members in our local, national, and global community to make positive and lasting change. And um, that is what we are about, and that's a lot about what this conversation tonight is about. 
but I'm hopeful we can all learn from this conversation about how we go forward as change makers. We'll make sure there's plenty of time for you all to engage in the dialogue. I'll start with some questions. And then as Courtney mentioned, we wanna hear questions from everybody so that we can have um, folks be able to engage with the panel directly. But I'll do some at first and I'm gonna introduce our panel and uh, we're gonna hear from the experts on the, the topic of health and race and the inequity that we currently have in our country and that COVID has certainly laid bare, but we know exists and exists in many, many different ways. So first I wanna introduce Chasmine Jackson, um, who earned her master's degree from CAS in 2004 and today is the incoming Senior Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the American Society of Human Genomics. Uh, Chasmine brings a wealth of experience from the federal government and global foundations and I'm happy to say was one of the inaugural recipients of the Gates Millennium Scholarship, which is something that I had the chance and opportunity to work on when I was at the Gates Foundation, so it makes it even more special. Um, and um, Chasmine also, a little closer to home, was the recipient of the 2015 Alumni Recognition Award for her accomplishments in public health. And also, Chesman and I share some time at uh, the Department of Health and Human Services together. So welcome, Chesman. And second is Dr. Jessica Owens-Young from our health studies program here at American University. Jessica's work focuses on health in economically distressed and under-resourced communities. She looks at investments and policies that can improve health through community and economic development and how race and racism shape these investments and these policies. Jessica brings her expertise from her prior work at the Annie Casey Foundation and her scholarship has been published in places like the American Journal of Public Health and the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice. She earned her PhD in Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Welcome to you, Jessica. And our third guest is Ntof Kufa Nguyenye. And he is the chief of staff to council member Robert White, um, who I might mention is an alumnus of the Washington College of Law and a uh, Congressional Black Caucus, what we do, our Ebony Eagle honoree. Um, so and that is helpful and another connection and tie to us. And he serves the district today as the council member's most senior advisor and leading a team that is dedicated to lifting up district residents and pursuing progressive policy reform and championing gender justice and inclusivity. And he brings a wealth of experience from the federal government and the private sector. And we're very thankful that you could join us this evening uh, as a part of this conversation. So as we begin this conversation, I use one quote, there's another quote that I would like to do, and um, that is from the late and great uh, Congressman John Lewis. And when the ACA was in some very challenging times in terms of whether or not the Affordable Care Act would pass or not, um, he used a quotation that he's used in different settings, but he used it there and he say, said, we may not have chosen the time, but the time has chosen us. And I think that is where we are right now. Uh, in terms of this particular time and this particular moment. And what I'm hopeful is that this conversation can help us as eagles uh, and change makers know what we can do to meet this time that has chosen us. So with that, I'm gonna start and I'm going to ask broad questions to everyone uh, so that we can all um, participate uh, in the conversation and you all can hop in in terms of this dialogue from our panel. And I'm going to start because I think it's important for people to know the facts um, around how we know how disproportionately COVID has impacted um, populations, our black population in this country in terms of the numbers and the actual statistics in terms of things like mortality, 
morbidity. And while we're talking about health, if you want to add economic statistics, I think those interact because I am a firm believer that when we talk about health, we have to talk about both physical and mental health as we talk about these things and the impact of both of those things. So I want to open it up so that we can make sure that everybody understands the real disproportionate impact in numbers that we know has happened. So I'll turn it over and, and who wants to start um, this evening? I can cold call. I can. I'm a university <laughs> president. Know how to do that. I, I'm happy to start us off. Great. Um, and, and first, I wanted to just acknowledge um, what a great opportunity this is to have such a discussion um, and to be home at AU virtually. <laughs> uh, so you're, you raised the question about um, data and how COVID-19 is impacting Black communities. And first, I want to um, clear up what I think are some, some definitions that we should all be on the same page. We are experiencing a great crisis, uh, but these are longstanding, as you mentioned, uh, President Burwell, and I've been practicing. I'm so used to calling you Secretary Burwell. <laughs> uh, you can call me Sylvia. That's what it means. <laughs> Um, you just call me Sylvia. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But as I was mentioning, um, we have a longstanding history of health disparities in this country. And um, to orient uh, the listeners is that as early as 1985, the federal government uh, began to document uh, some of the public public's health um, disparities, and it was under um, Secretary Margaret Heckler, who basically uh, charged the department to identify uh, Black Americans and other minorities and identify those differences in health outcomes. Fast forward to today, uh, we recognize that health differences aren't health disparities. Health disparities are a particular type of health difference that is often linked to social, economic, and environmental disparity or disadvantage. Also, we recognize that health disparities are avoidable, meaning we could do something about it, and that they're unjust. And so in the context of what's happening with this COVID-19 crisis, this disparity is showing us not only longstanding health differences, but health differences that are unjust and that are avoidable. Um, as it relates to statistics, many of us have heard the alarming numbers of over 200 deaths in the United States. And a most recent number that I that took me aback for a Black community is that one in 1,000 Black Americans are dying from COVID-19. One in 1,000. That that is startling, but it also um, should motivate us to some level of action. I think, you know, uh, I'll, I'll pause there because I'm sure there are other um, statistics or issues beyond just health and death that our COVID-19 is having on our communities. Would you like to come, jump, jump in, Jessica? Oh, you see me nodding, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just to, to build upon what Jasmine is saying, um, I appreciate the definitions that, that you offer. And you'll hear me throughout the evening use the term health inequities. And so I'm referring to the phenomenon that, that Jasmine just talked about. Um, and in addition to the one in 1000 statistic, you know, we have other alarming uh, data points, um, such as you know, Black Americans are about five times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID-19 compared to white Americans. Um, and they're 
uh, like twice as likely to die from it. But one thing about data that I want to point out is that we know there are issues happening with the CDC right now. And there are concerns about data quality um, and making sure that we have the most updated data. When I looked at data today from the CDC about hospitalizations, you know, where I got that five times higher statistic from, I noticed that it was last updated on August 18th. Okay? It's October 1st now. And so perhaps that number has risen, right? We may not even know for sure just exactly how much more at risk Black Americans are due to the politicization of data, particularly racial and ethnic data at the CDC. So I just wanted to take a minute to point that out. I think it's important that we add that it wasn't being collected appropriately, and we're still not certain that it is. So in order for us to know um, the disproportionate nature, I mean, some of the best statistics that we have at this point, that you know, as a share of the population, the black population in the United States is 13%. But in terms of COVID-related deaths, it's 23%. But we don't even know because I think early on there was a question of how the data was being collected. And this is an extremely important point as we all go forward, is how the data is collected. And I think Secretary Heckler was trying back in 1985 to get us to the place where that happened, happened consistently and appropriately, but we're this many years later and actually even making sure that we get the right data. Um, you know, and that is a, a pretty large problem that you know I think you're pointing out there's the timeliness of it and then there's making sure that we actually can see the data in the way we need to to understand where we see differences where we see disparities um, I think that's a, a problem that we also need to continue to focus on and Tokufa did you want to add I, I do and uh, again thanks for having the three of us here I know I'm excited um, speaking of data, um, data can be manipulated, um, data can be accurate, data can be inaccurate, but uh, when somebody just mentioned, you know, there was a, a lack of collection and something that the district has been, something that the, the district has been very focused on is making sure we get daily or at least weekly updates. Mm -hmm. And because we're a, a city of 700,000 and our council, our DC council is so agile, we're able to work with the administration to get that information out, right? So, you know, as of September 29th, there were a little over 15,000 cases of COVID in the city, um, but about 70, 7,700 of those cases were black or African Americans then about 3,300 were, were white Americans or white residents. But of those 15,000 cases, 467 of the deaths were black, were black folks, right? And 67 white people and, you know, the, uh, the, the balance were racially ambiguous, right? They, did, they didn't collect that data. And that, I think that not, that, I think that underscores what's happening, what's been happening in this country for generations. Um, and I also, and, and not to dwell on the negative, but I do think COVID amplified the noise for black folks to be able to be heard. Uh, minority, minorities uh, being heard. Uh, someone mentioned earlier, you know, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. I think this, the country, the world coming to a halt forced us to really see what is really going on. And I think it angered people and I think it triggered people and I think it put people literally out in the streets, literally on emails, on, on conference calls and pushing their legislative, their legislators to do more. That's, that's, that's my quick point there. You know, I, I think that's absolutely right in the sense that the uh, unjustified deaths that we saw in those videos when you add it and you see the numbers that are disproportionate, uh, hopefully it focuses the minds on both, uh, on, on both things. And I think maybe if we could talk a little bit about um, the fact that the mortality rate is higher, uh, the morbidity rate in terms of who gets hospitalized is higher, and talk a little bit about why that is. And it is related 
to the uh, you know the long term issues that we have in our country. And I think talking about why that exists um, is a very important part to moving forward to the long term solutions that we need. And you know, we touched on a little bit with the issues of not having the data, but there are a number of other pieces that would love to hear from you all as panelists uh, about. It's as you know, I, as you can, this is something I've spent uh, time and, and, and thought as well. I'd love to hear your all's thoughts about why do we have that and how do we go about moving forward so um, that there aren't higher rates of mortality, there aren't higher rates of hospitalization that um, you mentioned. I can go if Jessica, that's hopefully. all right. All right. So um, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart as my latest research has really focused on the concept of structural racism and how it's impacting both black and white babies throughout the United States and their, their mothers and other birthing people. Um, this concept of structural racism that we have institutions that have embedded not only racism itself, but also specifically anti-blackness within its structures. And by structures, I mean, you know, the policies that we have in place, the practices that we have in place. And these policies and practices have been in place since the founding, since before the official founding of the country. And we're seeing them play out over time. You know, a lot of folks that I talk with about this issue think that, oh, it's just recent legislation. You know, it's, oh, the changes that we've made in the last 10 years. No, the United States policy is incremental and it builds upon each other. And this is why I emphasize learning about uh, US history and particularly political history to understand why we are at greater risk. You look at uh, policies like redlining, for example, you know, the practice of denying uh, black folks the ability to buy into certain neighborhoods. What happens when you're redlined out of a neighborhood that has great grocery stores or that has access to fresh fruits and vegetables? Uh, school performance is greater. All of these things build upon each other to put people in positions of precarity, uh, put people in positions where when a pandemic hits, they don't have the savings to rely on. They may not have investments. They may have to go report to a job that puts them at greater risk because they're in a service industry. So all of these things are connected and they're built into not only how we design our policies and practice our policies, but the values that are behind those policies. And uh, the values that this country uh, emphasizes, such as individualism, such as productivity in terms of um, making sure that you're making money to support yourself are all things that have put uh, black folks at greater risk. And I can talk about this all day, but I'll, I'll stop there. Others want to join in. I was just going to follow up on um, Jessica's comment. I truly believe that the uh, COVID-19 disparities are directly linked to structural inequities, including uh, racism, as you mentioned. Um, there's been a lot of concentration on um, biological health outcomes. And there are risk factors for uh, diseases like diabetes, for um, a person or persons who have cardiovascular disease, hypertension, sickle cell disease. And, and these are um, true clinical measures of how high risk someone may be in, um, in their outcome for COVID-19. However, there's less discussion about the social determinants of health, of where people <laughs> live, learn, work, play, and pray. Um, there's also um, limited discussion about people's exposure to COVID-19. Um, I was recently in meetings or conversations about recommendations to tell people, make sure you're six feet apart, uh, make sure you're wearing your mask, and all of these different important, make sure you're washing your hands, and all of these different important guidances, public health guidances that are necessary to combat this virus. However, I also learned listening to people that social distancing is also a privilege. 
uh, you have lots of households and communities that are intergenerational. You have um, density in certain communities. And so the acknowledgement that there is no one size fit all and that when we make um, guidances, policies, that we're acknowledging um, who's all at the table and who are we missing. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there because I, I feel like there may be some other input from panelists. I was gonna share that this, this just resonates because the work that I do, uh, most of you, you three are working maybe on a national level, right? And I mean, we look at national trends, but in my, in my work, it's so hyper-local, right? So, you know, the district has Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, there are eight wards, Ward seven and eight are predominantly black. The access to healthcare is completely different if you live in Anacostia versus if you live in Georgetown. You know, your life expectancy is different if you live in Foggy Bottom or if you live in Congress Heights. And what my boss has always said is he needs to consistently invest in education, housing, and workforce. Because those three things are the great equalizers. And your question earlier was about the, the, the rate of morbidity or the rate of hospitalization. And a good portion of district residents may not have health care. So their first time seeing a physician will be calling 911 and then getting rushed to, to the emergency room. And that's, that's problematic, right? You know, and uh, Chaz, Chasman, was, Chasman was saying that, you know, it's, it's about privilege and or that being able to social distance. If you're in a certain social economic class, you're not going to have these. You're not going to have certain issues as as other as other residents, and that's where I think folks have to take a step back and realize what it is. What is it that can, what is it that we can do to truly make a difference? And it's so. I think it's first. It's it's basic education because I do think that there is a fear. There was an initial fear of. Of COVID, I remember when it was happening, and and to be completely honest, like even in February, I wasn't a believer that it was here, and not that I didn't think that it existed, but then I feel like late February, early March, everybody was like, "Okay, she's here, and she's settling down and not going anywhere," and I think that really put everybody, everybody at a at a pause. So you know, my mother is is a senior citizen and I haven't physically touched my mother since February, right? And I think there's, there's a sense of isolation that people have to go through. There's mental health issues that, that folks are dealing with with this. And obviously all of these issues are gonna be exacerbated if we're, because humans are, we all know humans are tactile creatures and this is increasing that, that sense of anxiety. But I'll, I'll pause there, Sylvia. I think you wanted to jump in. Um, I am jumping in, but my dog is quite anxious about these issues as well as are the children in the background. So my my apologies, but this is our COVID uh, our COVID world. So sorry. So I, I will try and uh, <laughs> be brief and get back to you all. I mean, I think that as we're discussing these issues, um, as we think about, I think thinking about what are the things that in terms of COVID policies that we need now that can help some of these things because I think what we're reflecting is that the disproportionate impact is coming from social determinants of health um, that are often the results of racism and policies as uh, Dr. Owens Young mentioned. There is the issue that we have many people who are employed in spaces that are essential and more dangerous therefore they're exposed more. I think there are the issues that there are some of the social determinants of health in terms of how they interact with the disease are challenging, such as density issues in, in homes. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the things that are policies right now uh, as part of COVID-19, uh, the right now part, that we can think about how we can move forward on these issues. Things like I would suggest that, uh, and I think the district is uh, working on these issues of how we have spaces for isolation and quarantine. 
so that you don't have to put your family in danger um, and you have an economic ability that you, there's a place that you can go so you don't have to put your um, family in danger. That those are some of the policies that as we're working through, are there other things that you all see that are important and can be helpful uh, to taking care of some of the greater risk um, that is occurring in our communities, especially our black communities here in DC? Ideas. Well, well um, we, we touched on it a little bit, um, or you touched on it a little bit at the beginning uh, when you mentioned the Affordable Care Act. And uh, clearly uh, to test and have testing and diagnostics, people need to have access to um, healthcare and insurance coverage is, is the gateway to that access. And so where possible, we, we really want to work to maintain um, the status and strength of that, of that law to ensure that more um, communities are, are able to um, have insurance coverage. That's uh, one thing that comes to mind for me. Uh, that's a great one and an important one. And I think it's very important that everyone recognize and realize that on November 10th, the whole system is under threat. And while most of the people on this call um, may not you know, be, uh, think that they are threatened by that, for anyone on this uh, Zoom who has one of their children on their policy up to 26, for those of us who have parents who are part of Medicare and had the donut hole closed, which uh, resulted in $1,000 less in drug payments for many of our parents, um, that goes away. For anybody on this call who has asthma, diabetes, heart disease, has had skin cancer, um, any of those things, the protections for pre-existing conditions will go away. There is a court, you know, this is a case that the administration has filed uh, and uh, several attorneys general have filed that will undo the entire Affordable Care Act and the Supreme Court will be taking it up on November the 10th. And so the reality of what you just said is before us all, and it is one of the most important things, because as I mentioned, in terms of the two communities that um, we saw the decrease in uninsured go to the highest percentages, our Black African American community in the US and our Hispanic community in the US uh, in terms of the Affordable Care Act and those that have been most impacted um, by that. So agree that is one of the things that from a, getting that uh, insurance. I would also add that if we had a national testing strategy, uh, that that actually is another way to get to the, the point where we would know uh, and we would create a national testing strategy so that that testing could occur whether you had health care. Um, I, I, I want coverage for all. I want that. Um, but also right now, can we think of ways to help those who don't have coverage um, right now? Others in terms of some of the policy things that we could do right now. Yeah, so uh, I know the district last year, it may, it may be this fiscal year, but last year we, we, we put in about seven and a half million dollars to make it easier for residents to renew their health coverage under DC Healthcare um, Alliance. And that's for folks who don't qualify for Medicaid, who don't, who can't afford to purchase their own, their own healthcare. And that does add an ease. It doesn't solve the problem. Um, but the beauty about the district is we're able to truly support a lot of our residents. There's, a, there's this notion around the country that the federal government subsidizes, you know, the, 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 district, the district budget, which is, not, which is not accurate. You know, I think our budget is about 16 billion, right? And that's no, that's no small chunk of money. And, and you know, $7.4 million is, obviously it's not half, it's, it's, it's a fraction, but we have to do so much as we function as a city instead of other states where they're getting where they're getting these other they're getting these other these other finances and also in the relief package from from congress we got we actually got a fraction of what the other states got so the district was 
shortchanged. So the 700,000 folks here who pay the highest taxes per capita are not even given they're just desserts, right? We're just given sprinkles and just say, figure it out. And that's the unfortunate consequence of not being represented. And that's what the district has been fighting for for so long. Again, my answers will be hyper local. Um, and I, I will let the, the experts speak to the national to the national issues. Although I'm here to say on uh, your answer about the marketplace, I had my, uh, our family had our insurance through the DC marketplace between when I was health and human services secretary and when I um, came to American University. So I am a, a, a believer, a user, a customer, uh, and appreciative for what is a great marketplace. I, I have the experience both as a consumer and I have the experience because I've worked with all the states on these issues. And DC, as you mentioned, does a terrific job in working to provide health coverage both through the marketplace and through Medicaid coverage um, for our families and our residents. It is a, a strength of, of the district. Um, Jessica, did you wanna add in terms of things we can do right now in this policy space? Indeed. Um, to build upon what Ntokufa was saying about education, I was thinking about early on in the pandemic when people were saying that uh, Black people weren't getting sick, right? I don't know if y'all remember that going around, but one uh, policy thing that I would do around education is to have a policy against miseducation to somehow have a system where we can ensure that proper education and information is getting out to the communities as soon as they need it, right? Um, and I think that ensuring that folks know what the risk factors are and what they can do with the resources that they have, I think that would be a, a great way to start to address the inequities that we're seeing. And the other thing that I would add is um, some type of housing protection. You know, there were um, several policies around the nation that uh, stopped foreclosures or like um, evictions for some time. And ensuring that those policies continue as long as we have, you know, stay at home orders or uh, a large number of folks in quarantine to make sure that housing is protected for people, because if you lose your housing, you're going to be at even greater risk for um, being exposed to COVID and having uh, poor health outcomes related to COVID. So those are the two things that I would focus on. Thank you. And I think one of the things you focused on is really an important one, um, both during COVID and, and beyond, and that is the education issues uh, and the movement of correct and accurate information. And I think that education extends um, to the communities that we're talking about, but to everyone else in terms of our medical professionals and how they work to get the structural racism out of treatment of patients, because we haven't sort of touched on that, but I think we know that that exists. We have data and analytics that it exists. And I think education recognition that it exists and then taking steps uh, in that, you know, I think the education is for the communities. It's also for those um, who are providers uh, in, in terms of those issues for the long term. I want to touch on one more thing before we go and, and then Courtney, I'll turn to you so we can get questions from others um, during the time. But one thing um, is the issue of vaccines. And, you know, in a nation where I, I think, you know, we have to uh, talk about things like Tuskegee, uh, and what happened there and how that severely damaged um, trust for good reason in systems and in healthcare things as we're working on this vaccine development. Um, wanna hear your all's thoughts about how we make sure to your point, you know, education and information flows uh, in the right ways and that this becomes a tool that is um, a useful tool for the communities that we're talking about, our Black and African American communities, as we think about both the development of the vaccine and when we come to rolling out the vaccine and that distribution of the vaccine. Again, thinking about these issues of who should get it first, how, when, why, and how we think about not having policies that build on some of the things that you had mentioned um, Jessica, and so your all's thoughts around the vaccine. And then Courtney, we're gonna to come to you with questions. 
I'm happy to, to kick off this one. Um, I am very, very concerned about um, deployment of vaccines. Uh, we know from research, health services research, uh, that uh, vaccination uh, among particularly adult um, African-Americans are, are very low. Uh, even if you look at um, seasonal flu, vaccination numbers have consistently been um, lower in African-American populations compared to white populations. And to add COVID-19, where there's been um, misinformation and concerns about the speed and the development, uh, there's definitely um, a distrust to, to vaccinations broadly, but COVID-19 in specifics. Um, I think that there are some um, key solutions that we should be considering. One is the transparency of uh, clinical information as industry clinical trials are being developed. Um, more information helps to give some sense of, um, you know, to uh, the American public what it is going on with these clinical trials. Uh, in addition to that, I think that we need more um, what I consider equity brokers, people who the community trust are saying that this is a viable option to prevent um, the spread of COVID-19. Um, and some examples of those equity brokers that I'm aware of are, um, as you mentioned, healthcare providers who work in these communities every day. Uh, example, um, the National Medical Association has been on the front line uh, to ensure uh, that uh, deployment of, of vaccines are equitable and that are, are actually um, uh, best fit for uh, the communities that they will be uh, serving. Um, in addition to that, um, as a graduate, I'm, I recognize uh, HBCUs being a really great um, uh, venue uh, for uh, this connecting of clinical research to trusted institutions that uh, many Black communities uh, very well would, would listen to, as, as, as I mentioned, an equity broker. That's great, and you, you uh, made me think of, um, it's Dr. Helene Gale who is co-chairing um, the National Academy of Science work on the vaccine distribution. That's a, mm -hmm. a it's an excellent idea and an excellent uh, thought in terms of, I think that's another person that, you know, we should think through how there are members of the community and people that are at the table um, where these things are being discussed and decisions being made and how that can translate uh, uh, in terms of the points you're raising. Others on this point. Just to build off of what Jasmine is saying, uh, community health workers, so folks who live in the communities, who know the people in the communities are a great resource to start to build trust. And, you know, I'm really concerned about this trust issue. You know, we don't have to go as far back as Tuskegee, right? We just had recent stories about forced hysterectomies in um, detention centers, right? And those stories uh, resonate with folks in the Black community um, because we have many instances of those kinds of issues in our community. So if we work through trusted folks, like Jasmine was saying, such as community health workers, we can even look at uh, working with folks who are in faith-based places like churches, like mosques, like synagogues, uh, places where people um, do trust other folks and that uh, we can trust that we'll disseminate um, proper information to the people who need it the most. And so that's, that's my two cents on that one. Yes, I mean, when I was doing the ACA and trying to reach these communities, I'm gonna be honest, I spent lots of time, uh, Deltas, AKA, uh, in terms of communities that uh, these are people in the communities who drive what's happening in families and, and communities across the, the country. I, I actually went to quite a few barbershops 
uh, in terms of uh, places, to be honest, where information moves uh, about healthcare. I would go to uh, barber shops and beauty shops uh, in terms of places to help move the information that was true and, and correct information about the Affordable Care Act so people could uh, know and understand. So I think we have to be ready to use all of these tools and have a strategic approach to it um, that uses uh, I, I, the, the concept, uh, Chesman, that you've mentioned. Want to add any? I was just going to add something. Local level. Yeah, just, <laughs> well played. Um, just really, it's, I think there is a trigger for many black, brown folks when they hear clinical trial. You know, I have folks in my family who have perished because of bad medicine or they didn't, you know, uh, they did not know that. So for example, somebody in my family used to wear a, a bracelet that would say, I'm allergic to X, Y, and Z drug. And they gave him X, Y, and Z. Um, so people, people need to hear from folks that look like them. Um, and that's just to be 100% clear, right? And representation matters. And I'm not going to, and I don't think we have been dancing around, but there is racism in healthcare as well, right? And, you know, there's a, there's a concept of when, so like my doctor is, is, is my, my primary care physician is, is Caucasian, but his approach to me has been better than any other physician I have had. Um, but I do think you have to be able to empathize and humanize your patients because there's there's something that resonates when you're when you're nervous when you're scared right and the last thing I want to share is with the trials my understanding I'm not a health expert but you know something as simple quote unquote simple as a as a heart attack looks different in a man than it does a woman and you know, if we're not in those trials, we will never see those. But we have to be able to communicate to the Black community, the minority community, that it's important to be part of the trial so that we can also be part of the results. That's, it's very, very true. And that was one of the things at NIH that we spent time on, is making sure that trials, you know, it wasn't for COVID at that time, but trials, whether they were cancer or otherwise, included uh, diverse populations because that has historically not uh, been done. You have to actually make it a part of the trial um, protocols to, to ensure that you, you do those kinds of things. So I think that's tremendously important, but it, it is a trust issue. Um, and there are reasons, as we've said, that there is a, a trust problem in terms of both participation in the trial, even before we get to the stage of a working vaccine. Um, Courtney, questions from folks. You coming back, Courtney? I'm coming back. I think my face will be there, but for now, at least you can hear me. Um, first of all, fascinating conversation. And I just think we're so fortunate to have so many points of view and such broad levels of expertise. There are several questions that we'll address, oops, se uh, several questions that we've addressed in the chat. So I'll keep that and I encourage you to and, and continue to write questions. But I want a, a fair warning to all the panelists. We received a number of questions from registrants before we even started. And I want to end with that question because I think it'll be a good end point. And that is, what can we do as a community who really cares, both our students, um, our faculty, our research, our staff, what can we do to help those communities uh, who are especially affected by COVID in a way that are most vulnerable. And, and M. Takufa, I may also say to you, what are there things that our students can be doing specifically um, to help you and the work that you're doing here in DC? So that, I'm saving that one, but let's start with the chat, which is how do we get the healthcare community to pay attention to the black community as much as they do the white community? That's heavy. That's I, a, I know. Let's <laughs> start out with a bang. That's like a nice broad it, stroke. Um, we address it all here. Yeah. So Jessica, I'll let you. I mean, I, I feel like we'll we'll probably all be saying the same thing. I do think. I mean, it, it goes back to representation. So something as simple as, you know, everyone. So at the local level, 
vote for people that look like you vote for people that and not necessarily just because they look like you but represent the things that you care about and that's that's first and foremost um engage with the different associations every single association in this city in this country has a government relations arm if you donate to anybody if you donate to american university you should be asking President Burwell, what is what is the pres what is the university doing for impoverished communities in the district? Um, if you donate to your high school or whatever it may be, anytime you give money to anybody, you should be asking how that money is spent. And most places that you donate to have a board, and they are responsible to res to to their to the members. So that's. That's first, and then I, and I think Sylvia, you mentioned you know deltas, AKAs, fraternities, sororities, civically, civic in folks who are civically engaged are tied to the community, and it's generally easy to find folks that are doing great work. I will say there are a lot of community advocates that are not doing great work, so you have to be able to sift and synthesize that data for yourself and not believe everything that everybody says. So I'll, I'll pause there. I second that notion on voting, um, especially down ballot. You know, we often just focus on the president and vice president, but the local elections really do matter a lot. Um, and another thing that I would focus on, I mean, this is a long-term vision, but how we train medical professionals. You know, one of the approaches that I take with my students in the Department of Health Studies and AU more broadly is to ensure that they are rooted in an understanding of what justice is and that they are rooted in an understanding of cultural humility, that we have multiple cultures, we have multiple populations that we will be working with, and that once they leave AU, they are going to apply these principles to improve and protect these populations health. And so thinking, beginning way before undergrad, exposing uh, young folk of all racial and ethnic backgrounds, but especially black folks to uh, possible career paths, not just medical doctors, right? But support folks becoming nurses, becoming um, physician's assistants, becoming nurse practitioners uh, from an early age. And when you are in training, um, in your uh, health professional training, that you get an opportunity to work with folks who do look like you, right, if you are a Black student, but also if you are not a Black medical student, that you have an opportunity to work in diverse communities. You know, how many people go through medical training without ever treating a Black patient or uh, go through medical training or any type of health uh, professional training without understanding how different conditions and diseases present themselves on Black skin, right? Uh, so making sure that uh, people who are becoming health professionals have these opportunities to work with the Black community. All great comments and I would just um, add uh, on, on it, we've talked a lot about systems, but on an individual level, I, I would really charge each one of us to look um, and see each other as human. I think this, this um, pandemic <laughs> that's affecting our, our entire world, that is the enemy, not each other. And, and as much as possible, I think there's a, um, either a proverb or, or South African um, word called um, Mbutu. And Mbutu means I acknowledge your humanity. I think if we start there, we'll see extreme um, improvement in, in how we interact with Black people. I see you. I see you. I smile because I used Mbutu in one of my commencement addresses. I I really uh, and it is the word and I did use it uh, and I did. Uh, so I am smiling um, uh, because of that. Uh, I'm smiling because mention of the AKAs to this crowd is the right thing to mention as a powerful, powerful group of uh, folks that are on this call. You, you might not have known, you know, in terms of that as a, an answer to the question. And I will answer your question. People do ask and should ask, 
And I do want to reflect and use it as an opportunity to actually reflect something important. Our Dean, uh, Dean Cheryl Hoka McCoy is on this uh, call and one of the things that we have done is we have focused, and I know we've talked about healthcare, but you mentioned the relationship of healthcare and education. And here um, at American University this past year um, and over the last two years, Dean Hoka McCoy um, has put together a, a, a program, a DC Teacher Pipeline Program. So we have teachers that come from the district come to American University and go back in. We This year, we put $3 million and we've also had some help and support from a, a private donor. And we have 11 district scholars. These are students who come from the district schools and come to American University. And two of those scholars are in our DC Teacher Pipeline Program, which means you come, you're scholarship, you go to our School of Education, you receive the training at our School of Education, and you go back. Your scholarship includes that you will teach in the district system so that there are people who are from the district, who look like our students in the district, and who receive the training and work that um, uh, Dr. Holcomb McCoy has in terms of connecting to our anti-racist work at the university, she's including that as part of what we're doing uh, as we're training our teachers and um, the work that we do there. So in terms of some of the answers to the questions, yes, we, we do need to ask those questions. And I just wanted to use it as an opportunity um, to highlight some of the great work that our School of Education, which we made uh, independent, um, because we think it is a place that's going to just do so much in our community. Uh, it contributes far beyond that, but we are very focused on the work with our community. I also say we have a partnership with Martha's Table and Trinity um, that uh, is deeply focused on the issue of early childhood education and making sure that the district has educators um, that are credentialed to do that work for our children. So. Great, I'm going to, there, what are the questions I'm going to, the second question save toward the end as it, so that I can match things together. So I wanna move on and ask a, a question to you all, to, two of them that are related in different ways to the vaccine issue. So the first is actually, we talk a lot about vaccines, but what about, what should we be doing to uh, talk about the, the connection between preventative care, uh, whether it's the lens of nutrition and what we can be doing to make sure that our bodies are uh, able to prevent the virus. So that's, that's one question. What are, uh, what are your thoughts on preventative care through the lens of nutrition and education for COVID? And then the other on the vaccine side, and I'll put them both out and you can choose what to talk about. Um, there was a, and, and I'll, I'll read this, um, in, in certain places, the media has been, uh, in Atlanta actually, reporting a lack of minority participation in vaccine trials. And this may be attributed to minority mistrust of government healthcare apparatus. Uh, once a vaccine comes to the market, should minority communities be concerned about efficacy to their specific genetic maps since there hasn't been broad minority participation in vaccine trials? Two very different questions, but I uh, wanted to put them both out. Yeah, both of those questions are quite large. Um, yeah. But coming from a public health background, I think about prevention a lot. And uh, nutrition is indeed the basis of our, our prevention efforts. And I think that we should be looking at how we are getting nutritious foods to communities now, especially folks who may not be able to go to the grocery store as often. So are there opportunities for us to support programs like Lyft, who has partnered with um, several healthcare systems to provide fresh fruits and vegetables or to bring groceries to people who need it most. Um, and again, this also still ties to education, right? We can hammer the point that we need to be eating more nu nutrient dense food, right? But we have to make sure that folks know how to prepare them and that they understand what we mean by nutrient dense food. Um, and so I think that if we build uh, basically like a pipeline of, of different uh, community-based uh, services to ensure that people are actually getting food at home, especially those who may not be able to travel as often or who may be concerned about being in public 
places like grocery stores um, to leverage our existing resources in a different way, uh, particularly through partnerships. So that's one thing that I would do for the prevention part of it. Well, one thing, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna add, um, besides uh, nutrition, um, I know that we've all really been confined, uh, but I know also we have to get moving and exercise <laughs> and finding creative ways to, to do that in a safe um, social distance way is really encouraged. I also wanna pitch, I'm not a medical doctor, but I highly recommend <laughs> um, as a public health professional that um, we get the flu shot. <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> yay, <laughs> um, got mine. <laughs> but this is, this is, you know, we are, um, I think term has been termed twindemic. We are entering um, our flu season on top of COVID. We've not seen this before. And although there may be um, hesitancies uh, with with vaccination, although, uh, and I think, you know, I've heard a lot and also read in literature, some of it is, is the thought that, you know, you get a vaccine, then you actually get it. Um, like if you have a flu, vac a, a flu vaccine that you'll get the flu, um, or even the side or the fear of the side effects. Uh, but I really do encourage um, as many people to, to get vaccinated for the flu this season and encourage your family and friends to do so as well. I'm just gonna add something very quickly about uh, prevention. And I do think it's about food security. And this goes back to what I mentioned earlier, east of the river, there are only three grocery stores that service 40, 50, 60,000 people. That's, that's mind boggling to me. Um, but there are also certain clinics that, that uh, physicians are writing prescriptions so that residents can get fresh fruits and vegetables. So that's something that the, that the city is doing. Um, there's also been a, there's been an investment by the, by the DC council to bring, I, I can't remember the name of the grocery store. I think it may be Lytle. Aldi, I think it's Lytle. Um, it's coming to to Ward Seven, so now there will be you know four grocery stores. So just having access to food and not being in the food desert, and there may be there may be folks on the call who don't live in the city or are not from the city or have never lived in the city, and being in a food desert is, is problematic because if all you have is a Seven Eleven or a corner store, you're gonna drink high what is it, high fructose corn syrup and sodas and chips, and it'll give you like energy, but it's empty calories and that does not help you grow. And again, I'm not a specialist, but I see, I see children in the neighborhoods that I've lived in in the city first thing in the morning, that's what they're doing. And it's, it's just not good. It's just not good. And that, that predisposes, you know, pe there, you know, certain things give you pre predispositions to hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, and there's no reason to uh, escalate that by not eating healthy food. The three of you helped to address one of the questions from one of our attendees who said, this is a million dollar question, and it is. And that is that the health inequities that we talked about, that we've been talking about since six o'clock are vast and they're broad. Uh, and to tackle, how do you tackle it from the root, essentially? And I think that you're starting to, all three of you started to look at some ways that we can do this. So in a sense that, that, that looks at uh, question number two. Does anyone want to comment on the question about the vaccine and concern that people will not trust it? I think we sort of highlighted that earlier and how to, how to, how to get people to trust it. And I think it's just more so the way it's communicated. And, and to be honest, it wasn't until six weeks ago when one of my friends who's a physician told me you're one of those that doesn't believe in it but if you're not part of the trial you, you may not be you it, it may not benefit you right so i think it's how do we socialize things the government has you know the government's our the local government companies 
all of these folks are, are have, have master marketing plans, right? If they can, if they could have told you 60 years ago that smoking a cigarette wasn't going to kill you, they can figure out how to, how to, how to tell the American public, you know, this is how you should, you should navigate that. And then I'm not sure it's, it's incumbent on a local official, but I do think as you, if you have your council members, your mayors, your senators, et cetera, your industry leaders, your church officials, all on the same page, then the music sounds a lot different than if it's if if everyone is saying disparate saying saying things with disparate with dif disparate information. Just taking that a step further, and this is one of the questions: uh, What are your thoughts about the use of technology to disseminate information? Given trust is an issue, um, and this is especially about the growing distrust in online information. Uh, how do you address that? What are your thoughts there? I think that the um, the different platforms that technology brings is actually um, an advantage. I mean, there are, there are so many people um, who use diverse platforms to get information. I, I used to think, uh, you know, I, I traditionally read the paper every morning, uh, but I don't know <laughs> on average how many people rely on um, newspapers to get information anymore. Uh, a lot of people may use social media as their first line of, of getting um, information. So I wouldn't cancel out any one um, source. I think that the communication piece is to make sure that things are um, trustworthy and culturally appropriate. And um, we, you know, combat misinformation by speaking the facts, I think. Um, and uh, something that was said a little bit earlier that I wanted to, to piggyback on as it relates to vaccines, uh, as we're looking at COVID-19, there are multiple candidates right now. Um, and so I would encourage people to uh, try to listen uh, more to what scientists are sharing regarding um, the efficacy of these clinical trials, who's being included. Uh, I personally would support um, trials that are diverse, not only diverse with uh, race, ethnicity, but also age. Age, yeah. Um, I, uh, at, as your moderator, let us go a, a bit long and we're almost going to wrap up here. And I wanna remind you that any questions we didn't address, we will, uh, reach out with answers to those questions. But if we had a speed round minute, <laughs> not even a minute, just to say, what can we, I think we all want to walk away feeling uh, as you have and empowered to do something. What would be your advice for those of us, for alums, for our students, and how we can uh, make a difference? My two things, go vote. And the second thing is to, when you are sharing information, vet your information. Just take a minute to make sure that what you are sharing is accurate and factual. Uh, so I, I, I'll go, he's the ladies first, I guess. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say um, I want to leave with equity. Um, there, we've talked about inequities, we've talked about systems issues, um, we've talked about disparity, we've talked about COVID, and, and I really do want um, us to seize the moment that we're in. Um, it has been brought to our attention, it's right in front of our faces, uh, racism, and this is the first time, at least in my career, that I've seen so many organizations uh, call out systematic racism, uh, it's declared a public health emergency, and we need to seize this moment to really push an agenda um, around equity. And everybody can play a part in that, whether you're a leader um, at the top of organizations or you're a leader in your family, um, we, have a, we have a contribution to, to make that difference. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll steal one of Jessica's answers because I have to, and I believe it is vote. Please vote. Um, vote for somebody. 
Um, even if it's yourself, you can always write yourself in, but be active. But I also think you have to get involved in things that matter to you. And as I mentioned earlier, if that means you're going to be civically engaged, if that means you're going to be doing stuff in your homeowners association, if you're in, in if you're at school, ask leadership, what are they doing to help break these cycles? If you are in leadership, have people at the table that do not look like you so that there can be a healthy discussion. Because if you're in a silo and all you're hearing is the same thing over and over, you, you're, you're never going to learn. So th those are the two things that I would say. Inspiring. Before I turn it to Kathy to close us, I have to ask President Burwell if you have a last word for us. Well, I will answer the question. One is please do get your flu shot for each and every one of you um, to keep your health uh, and safety. That is an immediate thing. The second thing I would just ask is please support our students right now in terms of the mentoring and support that they need. Um, I think we've talked about the importance of having people that look like you and understand your experience. Um, be supportive during trying times and joyful times. These are some of the challenging times. And so I would just ask all of our Ebony Eagles to continue doing what you all do like no other group. And I've seen it, I've been here, I know how much you all do. And I just wanna ask, I wanna say thank you, but I would just ask, please continue doing that. Our students are, are going through a challenging time and you all are there for them in so many wonderful ways. And it really does um, make a huge difference. So I wanna close with a thank you because this is, you all are an incredible um, part of this American University community that's active and an important part of who we are and how we deliver on our mission in a great way. So I want to close with that and say thank you. And as I'm saying thank you, ask for more. <laughs> thank you, Sylvia. And I will turn it over now to Kathy to close us out. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Courtney. And thank you to President Burwell. Asman Jackson, Jessica Owens-Young, and Mtokufa Nguinya for such an insightful conversation this evening. I would also like to take a moment to recognize the next vice chair of the Black Alumni Alliance, Mr. Kiwan Jones, for all the work he did to help plan and coordinate this thought-provoking event. Thank you. We ask that you stay connected with the BAA by following us on Instagram at AU Black Alumni Alliance and by joining our Facebook page. A very special thanks for all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Good night, oh, y'all. thing, because I'm going to ask this question about the vaccine issue and how should we know if it, it's safe or not. When I interview Tony Fauci next week, Courtney, can you tell people how they can figure out how to do that? Mm -hmm. That is one of my questions. Don't tell. Absolutely. And in fact, what we will do as we follow up is make sure that you have a link so that you can join that conversation hosted by our Kennedy Political Union students on October 6th. So we will follow up with that. Thank you. That was a great idea. Thank Bye. you all. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.